Welcome to Redacted Tonight VIP. I'm Lee Camp. There are ideas that are so dangerous, they're not allowed on our mainstream media at all. Usually the reason is because these ideas, if accepted, would mean the end of our profit over people, war for wealth, greed over environment, wage slavery system. The Zeitgeist Movement is one of those ideas. Even though it has millions of followers with hundreds of chapters worldwide and films that have been uh, gone viral and, and been viewed over a hundred million times, you will never hear it uttered on a corporate media outlet. Think about that. The media will talk about war and death, rape and genocide, pedophilia and racism. They don't shy away from those things. Yet the zeitgeist movement is too dangerous. Why? Because it questions capitalism. It says you are not being given the full picture of what humankind is capable of. It says a world without poverty, war, and environmental disaster is possible. And look, if it's a bad idea, if it's stupid, if, if it's a flawed concept, then let's argue about that. Let's have the discussion like adults rather than being scared of an idea, terrified of a thought paradigm that could upend the current cultural template. Earlier today, I talked with Peter Joseph, the creator of the Zeitgeist films, the web series Culture in Decline, and the Zeitgeist Movement. Peter, thanks for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Lee. It's great to be back on campus. And, and, and thanks for uh, wearing the same colors as me. That's very important that people know, uh, know the teams here. Um, <laughs> I, hope, I hope to uh, have saved humanity by the end of this interview, so I uh, hope you're cool with that. That's a cool. It's the, the, the clock is ticking, so it's all on us now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, the Zeitgeist Movement, it, it basically wants to move beyond capitalism, but capitalism has, has done a lot of good, has it not? There's been massive innovation in, uh, hu huge, massive innovation. There's been huge leaps in technology, leaps in human rights for women, minorities, gay people, potheads, uh, juggalos. So, so that's all thanks to capitalism, right? I know, capitalism made your smartphone. It, it basically made you, Lee. I mean, your capitalism impregnated your mother and produced you, so Absolutely. just keep that in mind. Uh, that's a, it's just sad how people have no sense of, of where things have come from through knowledge and science and technology and the beauty of, of all this scientific development that has really been the underscoring element that's increased lifespans and, and helped us. And it, capitalism's been along for the ride, man. I, I, it's, I've heard this over and over again. And when you look at the look deep down, all the major civil rights movement stuff, that hasn't happened from anything but the outskirts. That's happened from people that have been pushing things like socialism, as they call it. I mean, people talk about democratic socialism today like it's some kind of new thing when FDR did it, you know, 80 years ago. Right. Uh, and what would we what would we do without those safeguards that have helped improve things over time? So from technology to the advancement of civil rights, it's all based on the development of technology in part. I'm not saying that's the only issue, but if you look, for example, at the ab abject slavery, chattel slavery, how did when did that really resolve? It happened when when automation processes and mechanization started to be applied to agriculture. So if you look mm -hmm. in tandem, we really didn't start alleviating all of this labor oppression uh, until technology started to replace it. And that's, of course, continuing this to this day with technological unemployment. And, right. you know, we could talk a lot about that as we go along, but it's the trend keeps going. It's actually very powerful if we can just jump on board and not fight it, which is unfortunately what capitalism is now doing. Well, OK, as long as as long as you brought it up, let's uh, let's talk about technological unemployment. Um, the, it, it's it's increasing exponentially. I mean, with self-driving vehicles, we could lose a, a third of the U.S. current U.S. workforce uh, or at least their jobs in uh, very soon, 10, 10 years, maybe. Um, and, and I want to hear what, what your plan is, what, how you would view we should deal with that. My plan is, it, I, I think if we kill the robots now while they're babies, they wouldn't know what hit them, right? Yeah, yeah, no, the, the robot war is, is upon us for sure. Uh, and sadly enough, uh, the, it's two things that have been, been polluting uh, our, 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 our need for labor freedom, and that apparently are robots and brown people, if you listen to American politics. <laughs> but nevertheless, 
And of course, that you know, we'll let we'll let the orange the orange monster Donald Trump lead the way uh, with with uh, the latter of that one. You know, technological unemployment should be a godsend, man. It should be everything that we've been striving for as a species. Even John Maynard Keynes, you know, the early Keynesian economist, famous for realizing that you know capitalism is fundamentally unstable and we need safeguards. He said, even though he thought it was going to be a minor issue, that we're really resolving our economic problem. Literally, the economic problem of our society is a lack of means and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's scarcity. And with this new capacity for efficiency, which is being birthed in technology that's replacing labor, we should be harnessing that and happy about it. And instead, we're still trying to create jobs and create growth. And these arcane ideas are just going to hit a wall. And with the advent of universal basic income, something that will be a, a big subject at the Z Day event in Greece that I'll mm -hmm. be speaking at, Zeitgeist Day, we could talk about that more so. Yeah. Uh, this is probably the first step to alleviate that issue, to give people a, a standard of living fueled by this increased efficiency without them having to, to struggle and pay for everything and not having just the base welfare stuff that you, you see as well, which is nominal and looked down upon, to really realize that we can support society as a society for the first time in human history. And that, that's a powerful, powerful state. It would, if we could just jump on board with that and stop this need for labor for income and turn the tides and say, you know what, maybe we should not focus on people needing jobs and focus explicitly on replacing these jobs and adjusting as we go along, we'd have a much healthier society, much more peaceful society, too, because all the conflict that happens but with the scarcity reality that would be resolved, you know, it, it's, it's far reaching what this step forward could do. And I'll say that yeah. I, I think the force is fantastic. I think it's really, it's the, it's the door being cracked open by the contradiction because labor for income is needed by capitalism, obviously, it's the bedrock of it. And this contradiction is cracking that door open for people like myself, I believe in a, a design economy and, you know, and collaborative systems. All these things have been proven to be more efficient than competition and all the other uh, myths that support capitalist structure today. Uh, the door's cracking open. I think we're going to push through as a, as a new generation very soon, hopefully. Well, nevertheless, GDP, growth, all that stuff is old, arcane. Needless to say, you can't have a society based on growth. You need a society, society that lives in coexistence with itself and the habitat. I don't know how that logic has, uh, has, has eluded us for so long on the political, on the, uh, excuse me, the uh, political uh, economic level. In political economy, no one seems to talk about the problem with assuming the interest of growth. And of course, it's like a cancer, you know, capital accumulation. You can use that old Marxist term, but it's just as relevant today as it was then. All the corporations, like a disease, like cancer, they stretch out and they want to get more and more. They make a million dollars one year, they need to make two million the next year, they get more employees. The last thing you want to do is contract. And, you know, infinite growth, I think there's only one, literally one type of mechanism that does that on Earth, apart from our economy, and again, that is cancer itself. So it's a cancerous system, and, and something's going to have to happen to shut this thing down before it eats itself alive, or we literally get to that point of no return, which I... I uh, I'd say about 2030, 2040, when you look at the biodiversity loss, when you look at climate change, you look at the debt crisis, when you look at the resource overshoot about a sixth of the way through on this planet, we consume more resources than we're actually uh, able to produce by the planet. We need many more planets in the future. By one estimate, 27 more planets by 2050 if we're to keep the current rates going. Uh, and the sad thing is the, the global south is never, ever going to reach a high level of, of, uh, of public health and, and sustainability mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and alleviation of poverty uh, because all the mechanisms we're using based on growth are just rapidly tearing things apart uh, to an effect where the long-term long -term repercussions are going to are going to settle down the global south and Africa and mm -hmm. Latin Central America. They're the ones that are going to suffer from all this because they're not going to have a chance because of all the negative externalities that are being birthed from all the activity of the global north. Remember, the global north consumes everything. We, 80 percent of all the goods and services produced on this planet are consumed by less than 20 percent of the population stuck in America and Europe. So that's it's sad. Doesn't doesn't that sad. just doesn't that just mean we're winning, Peter? <laughs> That's what, exactly what it means. We are absolutely winning. Winning. Hashtag, hashtag winning. But uh, to, 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 <laughs> to shrink that down to kind of one little point, maybe mixed in with what you're saying, like, for example, uh, clean water. There, it, it's thousands of people, especially children, die every day due to lack of, of clean water. 
Um, I saw a documentary about the same guy who invented the Segway invented a uh, water purification system called Slingshot that, uh, you know, you could dump diarrhea in one end and you'd have a clean glass of water out the other end. And it's, and it's you know, it's affordable. It's only the size of a mini fridge or something. And he's gone around to various organizations to try and get those in the towns and cities in, in Africa and South America that, that would need, that desperately need clean water. And basically no one one says that's what they do. The UN says no. The Clinton Foundation says no, we can't really do that. Ultimately, he ends, he's ended up partnering somehow with Coca-Cola because they need clean water to create Coke, so they're willing to put some of these things in these towns in order to get use his machine for their water to make Coke. Um, so that, it's, it's, that shows capitalism works, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the trickle through, trickle around effect. Uh, I don't know quite... Uh, how people defend it anymore. Mm -hmm. no, I completely agree. If industry, if industry wants it, then it will move forward. But if the individual or poverty, I mean, there's still people dying of tuberculosis on a massive scale in Africa. Tuberculosis has been off the chart in the global north for forever. And literally, the pharmaceutical companies have decided to stop investigating it. And they, in fact, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's been 50 years since anyone has attempted to perfect any treatments for tuberculosis, uh, given the circumstance and the epidemic in Africa. And the exam they, literally, they said this, that it's just not profitable. Right, it does. It does come down to profit. Uh, I also want to go back to something else you mentioned, basic income. How do you support that in the, in the is that like a Band-Aid to get a, getting to somewhere else? Or is that, is that a good idea? Oh, yeah, it's, I think it's less of a Band-Aid and more of a step. If, you know, if we're keeping focus on uh, basically eroding, eroding this uh, cyclical consumption, you know, uh, competitive, scarcity, exploitative economy, basic income is that first step. And other steps will happen, such, again, as, a, as working to push, push for more technological unemployment and applied mechanization to increase efficiency and safety and all of that. These are all cumulative. And, again, they'll be talked about at this event day that we're happening in Greece. And I, I don't see it as a band-aid, I see it as a step, as long as we keep focus on the larger order goal, which in the, in the view of the Zeitgeist Movement is, is at the farthest extreme, is the removal of commerce itself. We have the ability to do that. The original premise of commerce and trade and mm -hmm. all of its flaws, as effective, as effective as it has been over the course of the past you know, 2,000 years, this, this thing is not necessary anymore because the, what, what defines it uh, is no longer applicable because we mm -hmm. have reached high levels of efficiency. We are post-Malthusian today. I think we've talked about that before on your show. The Reverend Thomas Malthus came along a couple centuries ago and said, you know what, there's too many people. They're going to keep reproducing and then they're just going to die because there's not enough resources on the planet. And that's what the entire political economy is based on. The entire world has been based on this, this Malthusian view, which means that war is inevitable and people don't really care about war and how many people die, which means that disease will just be allowed to happen. I don't, I don't think people will sit back and want to see massive population, mass populations die off. But at the same time, they don't really do much to prevent it because they think that's just the way it is. You know what I mean? And that's, I think, yeah. the mindset of a lot of these people in the establishment. So, you know, it, all of that to answer your question, you know, these, these steps, universal basic, basic income, uh, applied mechanization, and then eventually creating a peer-to-peer -peer and open source type of design environment that eliminates the need for corporations itself, where you, we have the technology to do that now. We can literally create and design and use engineering systems that work in a digital realm where you don't, you don't need and it's less efficient, by the way, to have small boardrooms and proprietary property and all of that stuff. Uh, I could ramble on a lot about that, but what we have is a massive increase in efficiency of, of both, both production and mm -hmm. creative design. And both of those mechanisms that are doing that are actually the antithesis of what is supported by the market system. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I, I want to I want to go to a quick uh, commercial here and then I'm going to ask you about the current political climate in this in this country. Oh, sure. I'll be right back with my guest, Peter Joseph, the creator of the Zeitgeist Movement. Welcome back. Uh, I'm here with Peter Joseph, the creator of the Zeitgeist Movement and the Zeitgeist Films. He also has uh, the Z Day coming up, which we'll talk about in a moment. Peter, I wanted to ask you about, there's, there's a lot of anger in this country, justifiably, I think. People are, people are angry. Some people are channeling it into the Bernie Sanders campaign. Some people are channeling it into Donald Trump and racism. Make America white again. You know, that kind of thing. 
Some of that anger has to do with scarcity, I think. There's, you know, there's not enough money out there, there's not enough food, there's not enough clean water, not enough, not enough jobs dancing in the background of rap videos, which is my true dream. And if we just have the right president in place, those problems would be solved. What's, what's, uh, what's wrong with that train of thought? You have the counter-establishment dyad of Sanders and Trump, which in a certain poetic sense is kind of fun. I have to admit, it's a very amusing and <laughs> surreal environment. For entertainment uh, value, the, it's you know, great. Oh, that's for sure. But it also goes to show, speaking of that, uh, just how, how persua easily persuaded the general public can be as far as entertainment. And you know, the news networks go where their ratings are, where their, yeah. where their corporate sponsors get put the most money into. So therefore, you gravitate towards this belligerent known as Donald Trump. I don't think he's real, frankly. I think he's a weird hologram. But the structure of the system, I think, needs to be held more in account. I mean, why do we have a president? There's a question for the general public. And this is a business constitution. It's, as Thorsten Veblen said, constitutional uh, democracy is business democracy. And I think it was just dead on when he said that about a century ago. And you literally have this president of this big American corporation with all of its subsidies, which have now been funneled out into the transnational uh, industries that have culminated their own identity with the TPP and NAFTA and the like. And it's really quite amazing that no one sits back and questions the very structure itself. Scarcity, going back to that one, though, uh, I love what Trump represents in the sense of his rhetoric because he literally does, is doing exactly what all the other guys have done of the, of the elite class, and that is blaming black and brown people and, and, and foreigners for the problems of the world. And I, I think it's just so poetic that he's doing exactly what everyone else has done for for, since the beginning of this country to distract people from the fact that they're being screwed on a daily basis by the upper 1%. And they make them fear, you know, the xenophobic fear. It's, and, that, and that's exactly what he's doing. It's literally textbook. And frankly, I think he believes it. I think guys like that are not sitting there and trying to con the, the public. They literally believe this stuff. Uh, and I think that goes for the majority, in fact. You know, we have a conspiratorial tendency. I think Frederick Douglass was the one who made a great quote about that. He's, he said, when society makes you feel like there's a conspiracy working against you, uh, no property or person will be safe. And it's, the, it's to be feel, it's the feeling that everything's working against you when it's really this sort of procedural dynamic and poor value structure and these, these interacting uh, web of, of chain reactions that are inevitably oppressive. Uh, I've done a lot right. of work on structural bigotry and, and structural racism, structural classism. So in other words, to answer your point, it's just yeah. fascinating how this old ancient rhetoric uh, is still so prevalent, just like it was in the Roman Empire and beyond where they're blaming the external. And scarcity, it, back to that, is a big part of it. That's at the root of almost all of our problems on one level or, no, or another. Yeah, you said it's amazing that no one sits back and questions kind of the, the system as a whole. You know, why do we have this, the system we have? Is like, that's kind of reinforced all day long with advertising. I've heard people say, oh, advertising, you know, kind of evens out because if Coke's advertising for one thing, Pepsi's advertising for the other thing. So it's not like one thing has an advantage. I've heard this multiple times. I've heard it about the Democrats and the Republicans. Oh, the ad dollars even out. You have Democrats advertising, Republicans advertising. But people never seem to take notice of the fact that it's all advertising one thing. It's all advertising the current system. It doesn't matter whether it's yeah. for Coke or Pepsi. It's for this current, you know, uh, uh, profit over all else, uh, you know, dual party system. So really it is endless thousands of ads a day most people take in that just uh, uh, continues to promote this system. And in your, your last book, I know you have another one coming up, but in your last book, you, you talked about how then it becomes to the point where our own thoughts become indecipherable from propaganda. Are we, are we there? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, we've been there a long time. I mean, it's called cultural hegemony. Uh, this, that's a term put out by a theorist. Uh, sorry, I can't remember his name right now, but Antonio. Uh, never mind. Maybe cultural hegemony is Banderas. Where you hijack. I think it was Antonio Banderas. Yeah. <laughs> it's when you it's when you hijack uh, the value system of the culture, and, and we are extremely malleable. And speaking of advertising, as a, as a slight aside, which is, caters to your point, uh, and the fact that of course we are a social we're social organisms, man. We 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 are immutably. Uh, re responding and affected by the, the soldier. Our, our limbic and nervous system literally uh, reacts to the world around us. And it, 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 there's numerous studies, for example, that have been done when people 
are put into a room and they're purposefully uh, conned into believing something or, or making a measurement that is clearly untrue, like it's blatant, mm -hmm. like is this a circle or is this a square? And the people will say it's a square, but it's actually a circle. And they'll see how much it takes to get that person to conform to that value so they'll fit in with the group. Right. And it's pretty frightening, frightening how many people will conform to the group just because they want to fit in. And it's part of our system. Our nervous system has been measured to react that way. But on the issue of, of uh, similar studies on the issue of advertising, it's been found, you know, subliminal advertising, that's been made illegal because, you know, clearly right. it has effects. You know, they flash. But they did a recent study, and I have this in my a new book that I'm working on. Uh, they found that actual normal advertising, because of the way it's, it's been groomed socially, uh, the way it's evolved, it's even worse than subliminal advertising. And what they concluded in this study is that it's really a form of violence because effectively you get like a Coke shown on the screen and you're a diabetic and, and you get the Coke shown on the screen and they make these associations socially. Your brain starts to rewire itself with those associations regardless of your conscious thoughts. Right. So effectively it's, it's affecting you on a deeper subconscious level that no one was even really aware of in the past. And it's, it's you, you truly destructive. And, you just have to avoid it. I mean, literally, just turn off. Yeah. Do not listen to advertisements. I just, I, I don't, I don't, even, I don't do it. You know, you know what, uh, you know what made me realize just how deep it is was I had, I had quit eating meat. I had quit eating at McDonald's for probably a decade, but I grew up on it. When I was a kid, I, you know, chicken nuggets were my favorite thing. And I realized that despite not having been in a McDonald's for a decade, when I was driving long distances and I saw the golden arches in the horizon, I still, it still made me feel good. I still got kind of excited. I knew I wasn't going to go get a Big Mac, but it, it was right. like, why am I excited about an establishment I have chosen long ago to no longer eat at? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, believe me, I understand. Your associations get ingrained. We are not in control of ourselves, which makes us have a larger order of awareness, excuse me, requires us to have a larger order of awareness of what's affecting us. I'm what you call a structuralist. That, that's the term I'll, I'll label myself just for ease. A structuralist, Gandhi was de deemed a structuralist in the context he said, don't blame the person for their actions, look at the motivating structure that puts them in there. I mean, that applies you know, to like the military establishment. Yeah. I mean, Military, the military, for, for to be positive on some level, it's, it's, it's great to see people in their idea wanting to defend their country and their people. That's fine. But on another level, what you have is a groomed set of serial killers because they're serially oriented around the destruction that they're seeking. Right. And they've convinced themselves that all of this is of, of, high, of high value. So they're being influenced by the structure of the military to do what they're doing. Uh, as opposed to their own individual free will. And that's, that's really important. Gandhi was big on that. I'm big on that. I take it to, to many different levels. My big thing, ultimately, is that until we change the economic system, you're not going to change human culture. Right. The, the, the absolute foundation of our entire value structure, our culture, is rooted both in present and historically in the unfolding of our economy and how it's evolved, whether it's slavery, whether it's exploitation. Uh, all of this stuff is built into us now. Um, and we just, that's, that's, that's what pretty much what I could start to say about that. Is that's Peter, why I'm big on economic change. Before, before we run out of time, we have uh, about a minute 30 left. I wanted to hear about uh, Z Day you have coming up in Greece, and you also have uh, a new movie you're working on. You got a new book you're working on. I, I want to hear about all those things because people are itching for new projects from you. You've got them addicted, and you've created some sort of scarcity market around it, around your projects. And it's really, really hypocritical of you. You're figuring me out. I can't work <laughs> fast enough. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've been, everything's been long overdue for a long time. I, I just, I have too many things going on, man, too many projects. But yeah, Zeitgeist Movement, that's a, a big time consumer and also very important. We're on our eighth annual Zeitgeist Day. You participated in our Berlin, Berlin made event last year. We appreciated that. Yeah. And uh, we're, in, we're in Athens, Greece, which is a, a timely place to be. Uh, Athens had got so hit with its debt collapse and austerity and youth unemployment. It's, uh, it's in, it's still in shambles to this day, so we're hoping to draw a nice European crowd to talk about this. So that's the 8th Annual Zeitgeist Day. There's also local ones. I'm in Los Angeles at the moment, and if there's a, there's a Los Angeles event on March 26th as well. And by the way, March 26th is also the Athens, Greece Day. And there are ones uh, all around the country and around the world. If anyone wants to see if there's one in their area, they can go online to the social networks of the zeitgeistmovement.com and, and check it out. As far as my film, Inner Reflections, this has been very much overdue, and I'm in production with it now in tandem with a book that I was also working on, which I won't go into too much detail with because it's still in its kind of final stages, but effectively it deals with uh, the future of civil rights. I, frankly, mm -hmm. I think of all this conversation, at the very root of it is our 
is our mutual codependence and our, our interplay as a species. I mean, that's what we are, right? I mean, uh, our lives are defined by each other, and that's our entire presence is social. And the civil rights movement, as historically seen in America, which was so profound on multiple levels because of the history of America and slavery, a very different orientation than many other countries, uh, serves as a unique model for me. And what I've done in this book is basically taken the framework of the American civil rights movement and extended it out to include all the things that I've, I've talked about throughout the years with respect to economic change as the ultimate mm -hmm. root. I'll, I'll say in conclusion to that is that racism and bigotry, it's, it's grandfather, the ultimate overarching umbrella is classism. And it yeah. always has been. It's always been about that. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I feel like we could talk for three hours and not run out of topics, oh, yeah. but I really do, I really do appreciate it, and uh, keep keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate it, Camp. We all appreciate what you're, do you're doing as well. So, be good. Thanks, man. That's our show. Tune in tomorrow for a new episode of Redacted Tonight, which tapes with a live audience here in Washington, D.C. Email redactedtonight at rtamerica.tv for ticket details. Good night, and keep fighting. Thank <laughs> you.